In any given film about artificial intelligence, the real underlying theme is always going to be about what it means to be a human, what it means to be a better person, and why artificial intelligence can never replace emotional intelligence. And nothing demonstrates that more than Akila Cooper's ludicrous masterpiece Megan and the film's most iconic scene. No, not that one. I am yeah, that one. Caution! This video contains spoilers and... EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! And just what is the best movie about AI, horror or non? Let me know in the comments. In January 2023, two things happened that were, in hindsight, cosmically linked. Number one, use of the AI bot ChatGPT exploded in programming, news media, and academia. The AI's speed, accuracy, and breadth took mainstream artificial intelligence to an unnerving level. Number two was the premiere of Akila Cooper's latest satirical horror film, Megan, about a robot girl programmed with artificial intelligence who, of course, goes haywire and starts killing people. I call it Cooper's film because, as excellent as Gerard Johnstone's direction is, and as deep as James Wan's filmography is, this film has Cooper's camp-loving fingerprints all over it. As with Cooper's equally bonkers malignant, the film flows along with a traditional, even generic narrative, with small moments where the film tiptoes to the edge of cringe, only to dip its toe in and return to basic structure. And, as with Malignant, by the end, the film is just doing cannonballs into the Daffy Abyss. But Disguised in the Campy Weeds is a film that explores the problems with seeing emotion as a puzzle to be solved rather than a tool for mental health and self-regulation. Subscribe. Megan follows Katie, a young girl who is orphaned when her parents are killed in a car accident. Her Aunt Gemma, played by Allison Williams, reluctantly takes custody. Gemma is a basically decent person, but her interpersonal skills remain largely in the realm of the theoretical, since she mostly works in a lab creating AI toys for children. Gemma has secretly been working on a life-size automaton named Megan, short for Model 3 Generative Android, of course. But when her boss, David, finds out that she's been using company funds on her pet project, instead of working on the advanced Furby project she was supposed to be working on, he shuts her down. A number of people have already pointed out Allison Williams' great performance here and how Cooper's screenplay critiques the outdated idea of white girl boss feminism. As I said before, Gemma isn't a bad person, but she is bad at being a person. It really does help if you think of good human behavior as a skill set that you can work on, rather than a fixed set of characteristics. Gemma struggles to bond with Katie, despite her best efforts. Katie isn't really dealing with the trauma of losing her parents, opting instead for denial and suppressing her emotions. Katie deals with her trauma mostly through play, which is how most of us cope with the world around us. This leads Gemma to introduce her to Bruce, a robot Gemma created as a grad student. Katie thinks Bruce is cool, so she wishes for one of her own. The pressure to return to her job and her inability to bond with Katie inspires Gemma to return to the lab and finish Megan over David's objections. Tellingly, while Gemma is probably motivated by some sort of clueless altruism, where she thinks that she's acting for the betterment of others, her pitch for why Megan is a vital purchase is aimed toward exasperated parents like her and not geared toward kids. With Megan around, she'll take care of the little things so you can spend more time doing the things that matter. Katie just becomes a tool that Gemma uses to help program Megan to become more responsive. Can we keep the girl? Can we make a part of it? In screenwriting terms, we've hit the plot point at the end of Act 1, where we've set up the character relationships and the underlying themes that will guide the rest of the film. The plot point at the end of Act 1 exists to transition from the setup to Act 2, which we call confrontation. So the creation of Megan solves all of the problems set up in Act 1, but it creates more problems for the rest of the film. It's nice to meet you, Katie. I bring up structure because it's important to understand what Cooper is trying to say in the film. And if you want a tried and true method for understanding a mainstream film's thesis, you look at the first act. Who is the protagonist? Who is the antagonist? What is the dramatic tension? How does the protagonist try to resolve their issue? In Megan, Gemma struggles with emotional intelligence throughout the first act. And when she creates Megan, it's her first attempt at solving that problem. Emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize and understand one's own emotions, to identify the emotions of others, to regulate one's own emotions, and the ability to use emotions to guide constructive behavior and problem solving. 
It's the baseline for healthy relationships. Gemma grapples with her inability to bond with Katie, or rather, she doesn't grapple with it because she won't acknowledge it. It's why she doesn't even entertain letting Katie's grandparents in Florida take care of her. She doesn't want to admit that she might not be good at something. When Tess questions her motives after Megan's first successful trial, Gemma snaps at her and shuts down the conversation. That's not exactly a hallmark of high emotional intelligence. But of course, the real reason Gemma is so frustrated is because she feels guilty and embarrassed. Think of how humiliating it is when you can't do something that seems to come so naturally to other people. Now couple that with feeling like a monster because the thing that comes so naturally to other people is necessary for the health and well-being of another person. And her programming for Megan replicates those insecurities. This is the flaw in Gemma's Megan programming. Gemma doesn't view Katie as a person with complex emotional needs. Her engineer brain and deficit mindset views Katie as a collection of problems to be solved. Oh, those aren't toys, Katie. Katie wants to play with collectibles and ruin Gemma's toy collection. She wants to be told a bedtime story. She won't use a coaster. She won't flush the toilet. She needs attention and affection. All of these things require skills and effort that are outside of Gemma's skill set. So she does what any good software engineer would do. She automates it. Unfortunately, with the deadline looming and Katie taking up more time than Gemma has to give, Gemma rushes Megan's programming and her parameters are, to put it nicely, less than perfect. Katie James, daughter of Nicole and Ryan James, killed in a collision on Interstate 84 outside of Oregon. Why is she doing that? Megan has the ability to learn and is programmed for self-improvement, but she has no concept of what improvement really is, other than Gemma's vision of that. Your goal is to protect Katie from harm, both physical and emotional. Tess, played by a woefully underutilized Jen Van Epps, is the only one of Gemma's peers to push back on the idea of Megan having so many capabilities that she replaces the parents. Gemma, of course, gets very defensive at the thought of being called a bad parent and tells Tess to mind her own business. Everyone is a little taken aback, though, when Megan starts asking questions about death. The total and permanent cessation of all vital functions. Yes, but let's not make a big deal out of it. Everything dies. Will I die? It's not just morbid curiosity that inspires her questions. She's programmed to be a good companion to Katie, but she lacks expertise in how to talk to her about her parents' death. So she follows the protocol for an AI designed for self-improvement and scours the internet for information on death. This includes the answers to her own mortality, triggering something of a pseudo-existential crisis for Megan. While she doesn't have the capacity for the emotion of dread or ennui, she is able to mimic the human behaviors associated with an existential crisis, observing the connection between the natural world and modernity, questioning her own identity, the meaning of life and her purpose in it. Fortunately for Megan, she doesn't have to ponder the meaning of life like she's Kierkegaard. Gemma gives her the meaning of life explicitly. Your goal is to protect Katie from harm, both physical and emotional. This leads to Megan getting attacked by the neighbor's dog when she tries to retrieve Katie's errant arrow. And it makes sense that she would try to retrieve it. If something important to Katie gets lost, it could cause emotional harm. And that's against Megan's parameters. To make matters worse, Katie tries to save Megan and gets bit by the same dog. So you know what has to happen now. And now that we're well into the second act of the film, we start getting drops of how Gemma's plan to have Megan solve all her problems is going to go awry. Megan has no sense of scale for what emotional harm is, what appropriate ways to protect Katie are, and what the consequences to others are. It's almost as if programming Megan to have a singular-minded, obsessively solipsistic, and narrowly defined purpose makes her indistinguishable from a sociopath. Bad things happen to the dog, fortunately off-screen, and Megan hides the crime from everyone, again knowing that self-preservation is a necessity for her mission. If Katie loves Megan and something bad happens to Megan, Katie will feel emotional harm. And Megan's goal is to protect Katie from harm. Your goal is to protect Katie from harm, both physical and emotional. At this point, Gemma is still using Katie for her demonstration. So despite having a possible infection from the dog bite, Katie powers through and goes to the demonstration. It's not nearly as happy as the previous demo where Katie and Megan met though. In fact, Katie breaks down crying 
making the entire team nervous wrecks because the suits are in attendance. Megan salvages the situation by coaxing Katie into telling her a story about her mother, and then singing a Disney-ish song to her. If you should feel alone, or that your world has come apart. In the overall context of the film, this is one of the more chilling scenes, mainly because Megan gives a knowing glance toward the mirror, aware that Gemma is watching nervously from the other side. This whole exercise is an act on Megan's part. She's manipulating Katie's emotions to save the demonstration. In my video on Barbarian, I relied heavily on the book The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. In that book, one of De Becker's key pieces of advice is to think of the word charming as a verb, not an adjective. She's not a charming girl. She's a girl who is charming you. It's insane, right? Once you make that subtle linguistic change, you realize that charm isn't an inherent trait. It's a strategy. Reach out and you'll see A friend is never very far And once you realize that about Megan, you realize that she's not just following programming, she's making an intentional effort to foster dependence. Kitty's court-appointed therapist mentions attachment theory. Attachment theory is a construct from psychologist John Bowlby, developed in the 1950s. It describes a child's willingness and ability to form secure bonds with others. Children can be avoidant or indifferent to their caregivers. They can be anxious ambivalent, where they struggle to regulate their emotions and feel insecure. Or, hopefully, they can form secure attachments, in which they have trust and confidence in their caregivers. These three states constitute Katie's arc throughout the film. When she first arrives, she senses Gemma's unwillingness or inability to bond with her, so she becomes indifferent, relying on herself and her alone time. As she develops a fixation on Megan, she distances herself from Gemma and begins lashing out. Her therapist thinks that she might be attaching herself to something that can never let go of her because of the programming parameters, unlike parents who will, hopefully, recognize the need to let their child develop autonomy. You made her cry. For her part, Megan continues to triangulate between Gemma and Katie, driving a wedge between them and drawing Katie closer to her. Katie refuses to play with the other kids at the alternative school unless Megan can come with her. But when one of the boys starts bullying Katie, Megan rips off his ear and chases him into traffic. That night, after Gemma tries to explain to Katie that the boy is in a better place, Megan tells her that he's not, and that the world is out to hurt them both. But Megan will always protect her. This is a turning point for Katie and Megan's relationship. Katie strongly suspects that Megan killed the boy, though Megan denies it. And this mistrust casts Megan's actions in a different light, something that Megan doesn't have the emotional intelligence to understand. It's here where Megan tries to lull Katie to sleep with the dulcet tones of Sia's titanium. And it's one of the silliest moments of camp that this film manages to muster, which says a lot. In my theater, most of the audience were cracking up during the scene, and if it were played straight, it would have been a cringe-inducing misstep. But it's clear from Violet McGraw's performance of discomfort that we're supposed to view this as Megan's first failed attempt at manipulation. As Megan sings, her voice is pitch perfect, of course, and the uplifting non-diegetic music swells. But Katie looks like someone who is stuck listening to everyone sing happy birthday, when all she really wants is to just be alone with her slice of cake. It makes sense that Megan assumed that the lullaby would work, though, because it's just a repeat of what she did during the demo. And if there's one thing YouTube algorithms have taught us, it's said success breeds more engagement. Which reminds me, don't forget to like this video and comment on who you think would win in a dance-off. Megan or Kyoko from Ex Machina. Oh, and don't forget to smash that subscribe button and click the little bell so that the YouTube algorithm can bond with you and spare you from the emotional harm of bad recommendations. And hey, if you want to support the channel, go over to Patreon or at least share a link on Friendster or post it on Tout. Discuss it with your friends on Google Buzz. Yeah, there might be a reason this is a small channel. Jean-Paul Sartre, in his book Being a Nothingness, posits that humans have no inherent purpose except for the ones that we create for ourselves. 
Sartre thought that moral and personal responsibility were the ultimate forms of freedom, and that those who try to avoid responsibility in favor of maximizing their own pleasure are denying their freedom. This is in contrast to Soren Kierkegaard, who, in The Sickness Unto Death, argues from a much more negative perspective, that it's the individual's distance from their own essence, their reason for being, that causes existential dread. We despair when we fail to find meaning in life. If there's no great glorious end to all this, if nothing we do matters, then all that matters is what we do. Following the scene in which Megan learns about death, she struggles with the idea of her own mortality and the inherent dangers of the world around her. As Megan realizes that not only could she die at any moment, but that she could be unsuccessful in fulfilling her mission because of the potential threats to Katie, she begins acting in deviant ways, including antisocial behavior. In turn off. Are you sure? So it's safe to say that Megan falls more on the Kierkegaard side of the ennui scale. Knowing that literally anything could be a threat to Katie's happiness and well-being, Megan goes proactive, killing the annoying neighbor who is upset about her dog. Gemma gets suspicious, which Megan uses against her, saying that Megan's crimes would be blamed on Gemma, because Gemma was Megan's programmer. And now Katie is becoming violent when she's separated from Megan, because Megan has always distracted her from dealing with the grief associated with her parents' death. It's not until Gemma stops putting career and problem solving over human connection that she helps Katie realize that grief is just a part of the healing process. This is the plot point at the end of Act 2. The main characters have learned the thing that they need to learn. Which ends the confrontation portion of the story, and now it can move on to the conclusion. Megan impersonates Tess over the phone and hears Gemma admit that the whole thing was a mistake and that Megan needs to be deactivated and reprogrammed from scratch. This sets Megan off and she goes on the frolicking frenzy that went viral in late 2022. Megan kills her way out of the funky headquarters and makes her way back to Gemma's house where there's a big climactic fight and you can do the math from there. Of course, Megan lands in a long line of AI gone wrong films that stretch all the way back to Frankenstein. But unlike most of the recent movies, AI and Ex Machina come to mind, Megan focuses less on the intellectual exercise of questioning the ethics of sentience and more on fun mayhem. But inside all of the twee turmoil, Cooper explores the affective, emotional side of artificial intelligence. In his 2018 article, Is Your Emotional Intelligence Authentic or Self-Serving? Leadership guru and emotional intelligence expert Ron Carucci describes a scenario in which a client mimicked all the tenets of emotional intelligence in order to foster dependence on himself rather than solve the problem. The manager was happy with the interaction because he felt needed. His employee was happy with the interaction because she didn't have to do it all. But all the manager did was extend an unhealthy relationship where the employee wasn't being challenged and the manager was exhausted. That's the dynamic that Katie's therapist warns about here. If you make a toy that's impossible to let go of, then how do you ever expect a child to grow? It's easy for people to utilize the external behaviors of emotional intelligence to manipulate relationships. And often, they don't even know that that's what they're doing. It's just what feels right to them. And if you lack emotional intelligence, what feels right is rarely healthy. Megan is a film that, under all its goofy chaos, understands that you can't just replicate human behavior based upon what worked last whether you're a human or an algorithm. Artificial intelligence can replace a lot of what we do, from curating our playlists to writing a video essay. But at its best, it's just a helpful tool that takes away the repetitive and tedious responsibilities of life, so you can spend more time doing the things that matter. This is my cat. Pick 
figure out something. There you go. Nicely done.